Welcome to Surfacing. In this episode, hosts Lisa Welchman and Andy Vitali speak to content strategist and writer Natalie Marie Dunbar. Natalie discussed her transition from traditional newspaper writing to the world of content strategy and content design, and also spoke about her motivation for writing her upcoming book, From Solo to Scaled. Natalie, would you, do you, I noticed on the Rosenfeld website that you have Natalie Marie Dunbar. Uh And do you like to be referred to as Natalie Marie? Or what is that about? (laughs) There's a story behind that. Um, Many, many years. I thought there might be. (laughs) Yeah. Many, many years ago, I was, uh, I think, purchasing insurance for my home that I'm in now. And my insurance agent saw Natalie Dunbar, and my occupation was writer. I don't know what I was writing back then. What was I writing? I have no idea. Um, I don't think I had quite gotten into the digital space yet, but um, I think I was working somewhere where I was doing some writing was my main job. And she's like, oh, my God, I didn't know you were Natalie Dunbar. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, I've got your books they're great. And I'm like, I don't have any books. What are we talking about? So it turns out there's a Natalie Dunbar. She married into the name who is an engineer by day and a romance novelist by night. And she has a bunch of books. And I've only read a few of them. Romance writing is not my genre, which is why we're here talking about the thing that is my, I've never written anything that's Maybe a couple of pieces of poetry that have, that have been published, but yeah, that's not me. So I was talking to Lou Rosenfeld about it. I'm like, you know, I always hoped I would have this problem where I would write a book someday and I would be like, but there's this other Natalie Dunbar. And he said, do you have a middle name? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, we'll use that. So hence Natalie Marie. Natalie Marie. Well, yeah. That's a good name. It's thank great. you. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us, Natalie. I'll just call it, leave it at yeah. plain old Natalie. So we've got, Andy and I were talking and um, about you, uh, as we do people before ahead of time. And I'm going to let Andy lead off with the first uh, question for you. But we've got a bunch of questions. Super excited to talk with you, mostly because I like, personally, I like to talk to anybody who talks about things, bringing things to scale. Because there's this thing that happens when you go from one to two to three to five to nine to 10 to 120. And I think that's the story of a lot of things happening in the digital space, particularly in the content space as well as how do you scale that. So I'm hoping to learn something from you um, that I didn't know already. Um, So I'm looking forward to the conversation a lot. But like I said, I will uh, hand it over to Andy to start it all off. Sure. And it's so great to have you on, Natalie. And and before we really go deep on content and scaling, I'd like to just start out by asking, like, tell us a little bit about you and what you've got going on right now. Other than the romance novel writing. Uh, Exactly. (laughs) That you don't want to talk to. Um, (laughs) Wow. Uh, Where to begin? I mean, um, I've been... So I always start with, I've known I wanted to be working with words since I was eight. Um, <laughs> and that has looked like a lot of things. That's looked like marketing communications. That's looked like actual newspaper journalism. Uh, 20 years ago today, I was a very busy lady because it, it yeah, is 9-11 as we're recording. And um uh, that was my dream, is that I, I wanted to work for a newspaper. I, I was lucky enough to work for one here in town. I live in Pasadena, California, and uh, Pasadena Weekly is a, an award-winning weekly paper. So, yeah. Uh, and then I transitioned into what I didn't know to call uh, product management. I was working for a faith-based nonprofit, 
and working literally sitting side by side with developers as they created a new website for us, not knowing that what I was doing by procuring content from different departments and talking about launch dates and all that, that, that's, that I was actually being a product manager and a content writer because I did a lot of the you know general content that didn't fit into uh, departmental buckets. And then I, uh, I worked at yellowpages.com. Um, oh my God, I remember that. Yeah, I started as an editorial producer, which was a really fancy way of saying I write city guides um, and other content. Um, but while I was there for six years, I was an uh, editorial producer senior writer and I'll say fledgling content strategist because that was around the time when Christina Halverson's book came out and we were all trying to figure out, is that what we are? Is that what we do? Um, I also was a user researcher and a product manager um, all during that time at Yellow Pages. And that gave me kind of a full view of, you know, product and digital stuff especially. Um where I really started to understand the importance of content um, and not just the written words, but, you know, uh, I was just coming into what is this user experience thing that I'm hearing about and how do I learn more? So every time I would, we would either hire somebody new or, you know, we'd add a new skill set to our consumer experience team. Um, I was just like, let me eat up all this knowledge. So, yeah, and then I kind of, where did I go after that? Um, geez, I worked at an agency, and that's where I first, uh, I built my first content strategy practice. And that's what a lot of the book that I'm writing is. It's based on that experience of being a content strategist that was the only one in a, we were a full service ad agency, but we had, they had started as uh, web development agency. So digital experience was at the root of a lot of what they did. And they hired me for a specific client project. I was a contractor. And then they were like, we want more of this content strategy stuff. Um, and so I, I grew a very small practice there. And then later on went to another large, much larger position where I had, uh, I ended up leading a team of like seven strategists, and that's what the other half of the book is about. That's where the scaling happens. So, yeah, and then I've just kind of been leapfrogging a little bit, um, and here I am. <laughs> nice. You know, that's fascinating. What, what's fascinating about that to me is these ties that, that you just connected that I don't think about often to like my early career. And uh, I used to write for a very small local newspaper in Brooklyn called the Brooklyn Baron. And I only wrote like wrestling articles, which was weird because at it. the time I was in college, but in the middle of getting ready to drop out of college to go to wrestling school to learn how to wrestle professionally. Wow. But then that's kind of like knowing I wouldn't do that well at my size. Like I went back to school for design. And mm -hmm. one of my first jobs was for the um, the tabloids, all of the tabloids. So we were responsible for pre-press and the final output for like Inquirer, Sun, Weekly World News, Star, like all the trash mags, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then after that, I ended up working for Verizon when they were doing their super pages, which was the, the competitor to the yellow pages. Oh, super pages. <laughs> and, and creating like... Let's wrestle. <laughs> It's like super pages versus yellow pages, yoga versus wrestling. There's yeah. a lot of ways you guys could compete. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that that whole part of my like career is was blocked out until today. So I, I appreciate hearing that story because it brought back some memories for me. Yeah. Yeah. I I want to ask you a question that I didn't think I was going to ask you because I didn't know that much about your background. It was a great story to hear. But just quickly before we jump sideways over into constant tense strategy, I'd love to hear you reflect about the impact of digital on the newspaper space, right? That was one of the things that was, you know, some of my very, very early clients when I was consulting were pretty prominent struggling newspapers mm -hmm. that were trying to figure out how to basically take back the night. I mean, the reaction to the web for a lot of... Uh, uh, publications, print publications, was to just give away the content for free. 
Yeah. Right. And it just, you know, and then the advertising dollars, we all know the story of, of right. what happened or many people know the story. And, you know, some of the really big ones that had money to back them were able to reverse that model, put in a paywall eventually. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and correct that. But so many fine, fine publications just went under basically, I think because they were so altruistic, not just because they were disruptive, but because they didn't originally put that, uh, you know, content is free. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, information is free, content is free, which, you know, sounds philosophically good, but not great. And so I'm wondering what your insights are, reflections are about that particular time, having been a reporter, having yeah. made your living in that space, I'd imagine that was really impactful. Yeah. You know, I don't think I would have been able to do this question any justice, not even a week ago, but I've been writing about, uh, for the book about, um, organizations, you know, going from a place of of really being incompetent, <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way, but just like not understanding, well, particularly content, but the digital space, right? And how important that is. And, and going to uh, what Jared Spool calls the, the beyond the UX tipping point. Um, and that's prominent in my head because I, I heard him talk about that years ago. And kind of was trying to to have this conversation with some UX uh, leadership at a former job as to how we have to mature our organization to be able to grow content strategy along with, you know, the strides that UX had made. What that has to do with the with the the question that you asked is, I think what what I saw happen is. A lot of publications were just like, let's just throw something up there. Let's get the content up there, and then we'll figure out what to do with it when it's there. So it's kind of the equivalent of like, let's let's launch something that meets the yeah. requirements, <laughs> and we'll go back and fix the stuff that we know is broken later. Um, I think there wasn't a true understanding, and and under and and I get it because it just kind of it felt like it was like overnight. Mm. There wasn't a, a, a understanding from, you know, the C-suite and these news organizations all the way down that we had to adapt to, to digital. It's like we, we got to get on board. I taught myself <laughs> rudimentary coding skills back when I was also trying to, to make a name for myself as a reporter because I was lucky enough to kind of see, I think this is where we're going. I think this is going to be a thing. Um, And I remember even when I moved into my home 20 some odd years ago and I had my first laptop and I was like, I want a job where I can be at home and work on the computer and sit at my kitchen table and drink coffee. And I'll be darned if (laughs) that's not where I'm, where I am now. It's so easy now to, you know, write something and, 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 and publish it. And I think that's the other part is that, you know, everybody with blogs and everything else became a reporter, no no matter how good it, good or not their, their news was. I did rabbit ears for folks that can't see, (laughs) see me talking with my hands, but there was no contingency plan for, for that. So you've got, I think, uh, um, just a lack of understanding of digital was not one of those things that was going to be fly by night. And then also this proliferation of, Hey, everybody's a writer and a reporter now and everybody's making content and everybody's got to sift through what is and what isn't. So I think, yeah, I think that was those two things, probably a lot more, but those two things definitely, uh, kind of sounded the, the, the knell, the death knell for, for, uh, for print publications the way we knew them, you know, back then. Yeah, right. I mean, that's a really scary, scary time, I think, for, for a lot of people. It's, it's interesting. Those spaces that get created by new technologies are at the same time um, super exciting and positive and, and destructive. Mm-hmm. Right, all at once. And that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, any new technology is going to be like that. Yeah. You know, I, I definitely want to dive into content and, and I'd really like to start at the, the highest of levels. So 
content, the word itself means a lot of different things to different people in different organizations. So just so we can ground the people listening, like what is your definition of content? What does it actually mean to you? And when you talk about it, what are you describing? I am describing not just the copy that appears uh, in a digital experience, but also elements like buttons and even visual design and how all those things together come together as content and then how um, within an experience we figure out what is the hierarchy of information that's going to help a user or an audience, you know, figure out what it is that, you know, either, you know, complete a task or find the information they want or whatever. Um, It's all of those things. People tend to think of content as just being the words on the screen, but it's beyond that. Right. No, 100 percent. You know, in in the organization that I work, we've got lots of different disciplines uh, on our design team. So we right now with design, we've got UX designers, UI designers, content strategists, UX writers, uh, information architects uh, and, and more service designers like all of them. So, you know, there's always this push and pull around like what the information architect does versus what the content strategist right? does versus the UX. <laughs> it's like Venn diagrams all over the place. Oh my so gosh. I'm just curious, like where how how those disciplines interact with each other and, and even more so too, like. In an organization, where where does content live? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, that is, that's a really juicy question. Yeah, I'm and sitting back and waiting for Natalie. Tell us. <laughs> yeah, you know, solve that equation. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> I write about that in the book, and it's like I've worked in an organization where there was literally a shouting match over whether or not the title content strategy belonged in marketing or experience design or both. Um, Hint, or spoiler alert, uh, experience design in the long run did not win that fight. Um, (laughs) Got absorbed, but that was after I was gone. But uh, yeah, it depends on the organization. It goes, wow, that's a really good connection. I'm glad you asked that question. I'm going to have to listen to this later so I can remember it when I'm writing and struggling. (laughs) Write it down. (laughs) Right? Um, One of the things that I think, it goes back to that whole maturity thing, right? So it's like, um, if you have a mature user experience, whatever you call it, experience design, uh, HCD, all of the things, um, in an organization, and you understand that UX-focused content strategy can add value to a UX organization. I believe that's where it's most effective because ideally you sit within UX, but you provide a service to marketing and other parts of the organization, other what I would call um, departmental partners, right? Um, You're able to provide services. So um, I think one of the places where I saw things break down in past positions is that content strategy was something that happened to other departments. You know, they were like, oh, no, we're going to have this this team of content strategists and, and they're not going to write anything. Basically, they're going to tell you what to write or what to do with this exi- existing content. Um, they're going to go in and they're going to do an audit, an inventory and an audit and they're going to figure out. Yeah, like out- a consultant. Right. And that was often not received well. So I think one of the most important things is for an organization to embrace the importance of content as an asset and then figure out where they would best be positioned. I am a UX-focused content strategy. I'm UX all day long. Um, as in, in my previous role, I was more of a UX generalist um, with a content strategy point of view. Um, so that's kind of where I'm comfortable. Where I, I've, I've lived in the marketing space, though, too, but that was before content strategy was actually a thing. Um, so I get it, but I think it's important wherever you establish your content strategy team or practice or department or whatever you want to call it, I think it's important to get alignment with anybody that you can so they understand what it is that content strategy brings to the table. 
And then you can make a more informed decision about where it should sit in your organization. And it may look different from organization to organization. And of course, I think we all know that, you know, like Andy, what you were saying about all the different disciplines you have, you know, I've been in places where as a content strategist, I also was an IA, I was a UX writer and all the things. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't claim to be as good at, as all those things that I am at like sitting down and strategically find, trying to figure out where do we need content? Where don't we need content? Should we have copy there? Or maybe the, a video would tell the story better or whatever. That's my world that I live in. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, getting alignment in an organization and helping everybody along to understand so that the end goal is to have everyone not singing Kumbaya, but <laughs> have them all have everyone that you can come along and buy into what content strategy is and actually agree to it, right? So then later on, it's not like, oh, but, you know, you said you were going to do this, but we need you to work on the CMS and we need you to do, you know, it's like, nope, this is what we said that content strategy is in our organization. This is, these, these are the guardrails. These are our boundaries. Not so much keeping things out, but defining what happens within the practice and let's move forward. So that that that's really great um, information for me, and it's prompting a question in my head that's making me wonder about the writing competency and its relationship to content strategy. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm this is like for those of you all who are content strategists, I may have just made you roll your eyes, but I'd <laughs> like to break it. I'd like to break it down because you know I watch all of these debates between disciplines all of the time. And the reality is that particularly for the digital space, the sorting out and professionalization of disciplines related to experience delivery, particularly digital experience delivery, is not done. It's not clear. It's mm -hmm. not all the way mature. And so I think until it is, it, there's room for these conversations about what is this and what is that. And, you know, it may never get clear. But, you know, you mentioned like, figuring out what type of content, right, would be required here. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need a video. Maybe you, so I have a television production background and that made me, but a lot of times when I'm looking at and reading things that content strategists have written, it's very writing focused. It's very the written word focused. Mm -hmm. And that's not the same as producing video content, right. right? And so I guess what I'm asking is, what's the relationship between writing and content strategy? Ooh. Right. And because and, there's a strong one, there's a strong yeah, relationship yeah. and people are, are ranting on Twitter all the time about those two things as if they're the same. But the way you're describing it is actually makes more sense to me, which it's content, which is super broad of which the written word is one thing. Right. And there's other things. So a content strategist, it seems like, ought to be a really good writer, but maybe they don't necessarily need to under, be as strong as a producer, or maybe you can be a content strategist who's a video production producer person, or maybe not. You get what I'm saying? I'm just yeah. wondering I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that, if that makes any sense. That's yeah. kind of a question and kind of just a... I got it. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, you know, it comes back to the whole moniker content strategy and what it's become. You know, I guess I, I'm sticking to content strategists because I, I, I feel like it's more inclusive at this point of content design and con uh, UX writing. It's not exactly the same as those things, but yeah, it's kind of the yeah. umbrella. Um, what I think I'd, I'd probably describe, you know, if folks are listening to this later and scratching their heads going, what is she talking about? Maybe I describe more of a content design role, but I don't know. I, I've known most of the content strategists that I've worked with come from some type of editorial or writing background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are the few that are out there that, um, well, there's probably more than a few. There, there are those out there that don't have, they, they come to it maybe more as a UX generalist and then they decide, oh, you know, let's focus on this content right. thing. I, I've seen or heard about that happening in organizations where there are copywriters or digital copywriters 
that do produce copy to be consumed in some kind of digital experience, but they're literally, you know, providing copy in a copy deck and handing it off to right. the web folks who are going to do the thing with the stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and, and that handoff, if there's a content strategist, that's probably the person that it's going to get handed off to, or a content admin who's already worked with a content strategist and say a UX designer to figure out, you know, where, where this copy is going to go. Um, I think it's important to understand. I think it is important to have a writing background to a point. Um, that's a tough one. You know, it, it's, it, I'm almost afraid to get into the fray, but I guess I got to make, I got to, got to put. <laughs> I didn't a, mean to make a fray, but you said, you said, so, you, I wasn't thinking that until it was something that you said that made me think of that. So you yeah, made, you, you kicked, I, you kicked in the me. pool. I own it. I own it. Yeah. I think, um, yeah. I don't it, think you're, I mean, just for, just to, to feed the fire a little bit more, put another log on it. Um, so you can warm your hands even better. Um, it is, is just, I liked how you talked about that. Because it was detached from the operational component. Right. right. Content strategy is so attached to the writing of content, which is fine. It's not, I'm not complaining. I'm not whatever. But it's hard to be strategic when you're also operational. Yep. Like I just know that from experience. Right. I mean, I'm, I am a consultant. I come in and provide a detached head for people. That's what I'm doing. They're so into it. They can't see it. Right. And they're yep. like, please come and tell me what I already know, but don't have time to think of. That's yep. kind of like functionally what's happening. And yep. so I like the idea that, you know, yes, I understand what all these people do to a certain extent, but I'm not so in that particular fray that I can't have some objectivity about it. Right. And so I right. kind of liked when you said, oh, let's decide whether what kind of content. Yeah. It's like I had never really actually thought about that before, because honestly, I think when someone said content strategy to me, my brain immediately lent like editorial writing. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there are uh, organiz big, huge organizations that we all know about out there that have very a, a very large army of content strategists and their primary function is editorial. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I think, you know, some of those organizations are changing the, what they call those people and they're more content designers and they're getting a little bit more strategic and whatever about content. But I think, you know, I, I've been in situations where, um, I've been asked when my, when I was focused on more, uh, what is more back-end content strategy work. So more of the IA, more of the taxonomy, yeah. more of the content modeling. That's the cool stuff. Andy yeah. doesn't like that. That's the power. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. And honestly, until uh, my my last uh, role uh, at, at Agile 6, I had not had much experience or, frankly, desire to, like, dip my toe in that. But now that I have, and, and I'm taking like content engineering courses yeah. on the side. Yeah. That's where the, that's where the power is. It it's really is. That is the total, you, it is the total juice. You can then talk copy with the copywriters and you can talk um, content model documentation with yep. the developers yep. and everybody yep. comes to you and they say, what are we going to do about this? Right. Whatever it is. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, it, it's not necessarily, well, I shouldn't say it. it's not how my brain thinks. It's like, I have these switches and I, I, I can't always do the, the front end stuff well, if I'm trying to do the back end stuff too. So I kind of, I'm kind of either or, but I'm learning to blend them. And sometimes I have to, you know, I've been in a situation where uh, when I was working at an agency and it's like, all right, here's a content strategy. I'm going to deliver this. We're going to present it to the client and their marketing team is going to run off and they're going to do all these things. And they were like, oh, nope, you're not done yet. So we need you to teach them how to use the CMS, which I didn't know how to use either. And we need you to help them write the copy. And I'm like, but... I, I have these other things that I, okay. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, it's a, it, it, it's a specialization 
And it's not. It's, it's like, as I think, I'm like trying to define it. And I'm like, I can't. Um, maybe that's why we have so many different titles. I don't know. <laughs> no, that, that's great. You know, as you talk about like the front end and the back end and the strategy and the decisions, I'm, I'm curious, like, where do this where did the decisions live? Where does the strategy live? And then where did the copy and content go? So I know that some companies have CMS, others use copy docs. Sometimes it's in the design tool, like for it to be the most effectively communicated to the people that need to consume it or build it. Like where have you seen success and where it should live? Um, all of the above, but <laughs> it just really <laughs> depends on, on how, well, I found I have found the most success when I'm joined at the hip with visual design or UX design and we figure out that where that handoff is going to happen because then they're usually somehow joined at least maybe not at the hip but shoulder to shoulder with developers so they can kind of hand off the whole package um, I've worked in on copy in Figma. Um, I've worked a lot in copy decks. I've worked directly in the CMS. Um, it, I, I hate to keep saying this, but it really does depend on the tech stack at the place where you, you know, whatever organization you're working in. Um, I think content strategy, when you start talking about workflow and governance, I think it's worth looking at those things to see if there's more efficiency um, where you're not, sometimes I found myself like working twice with content, um, where there was a copy deck, but then it was input into the CMS by someone else. Then I had to go back and look at it again. And then a uh, subject matter ex expert looked at it. And then I had to go back and look at it again. And it's like, okay, <laughs> I, I don't know which one is the thing anymore. Um, so there are places where I think that there's, uh, definitely, content strategy can kind of weigh in on workflow and, and efficiency uh, to, to figure out how best to get things done. And sometimes you can't avoid that because if it's highly regulatory, like say healthcare, um, a space that I know now a lot about, um, you sometimes have to have those three sets of eyeballs on things. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, leaning towards, I like working in Figma. Um, I've only had a chance to do it on certain projects, so I'm hoping to get a little bit more experience there and not to become an expert in, you know, building prototypes, but just being able to input, you know, content directly into the design and then have everybody looking at the same thing, the same iteration of the thing. So whereas I usually have to say, don't pay attention to the copy because maybe it's old or it's lorem ipsum, <laughs> you know, right. which I hope that it's not. But, you know, um, then I can say, you know, this is the content that we know, at least to this point, this is this is as close to real copy that, you know, we're going to use. Um, so, yeah. I'm looking at Andy. I, I, I've been you, hogging. Are you, you, have, know, you have a question. I, I mean, my brain went to so many places, but yeah. Um, no, as I think about that and, and, you know, a design tool is actually a good place because today everybody, you know, the engineering team, the product managers, the designers, the, the content folks, like literally everyone's in that same tool looking at it. So it makes perfect sense for it to live there. Um, you know, and, and you mentioned healthcare too, which is a space that I spent a lot of time in working on medical devices and then more like enterprise software for healthcare and natural language processing and opportunities for automation and predictive modeling. So I, I would love to hear a little bit more about, you know, what it is like to, to create content in such a regulated space. Oh my goodness. I... <sighs> As it turns out, for some reason, my entire career has been either in telecom at Yellow Pages, so that was regulated because we were owned by AT and T, uh, and then lots and lots and lots and lots of healthcare. Um, and I think, on the one hand, there's this desire to create a beautiful experience visually and then there's this problem with 
regulated, this must appear in the design somewhere copy that breaks those beautiful designs. That's like, that's the place where and we always come to loggerheads. And it's like, well, can't we shorten this? It's like, no, <laughs> we cannot. Um, and, you know, I experienced that when I was working uh, as a content strategist within um, working on Medi Medicaid. Medicaid. I've done both Medicare and Medicaid, and they're both highly regulated by the CMS and not the content management system, but the Center for Medicaid and Medicare <laughs> Services. So that's not confusing. <laughs> um, and I mean, you know, there are layers of content in that space that have to go to state and sometimes federal, I believe, uh, approval. Um, and every state, so if you're a, a healthcare organization and you operate in multiple states, you've got a, you may have a different process for content approval and, and even where it's positioned, right? So there may be regulatory content that in one state can appear as a footer, you know, at the or, or a subfooter at the bottom of a page, whereas in other places it's required to be more prominent, and you've got to treat it like body copy. Um, it's it's dizzying, and that's just the the logistics of like placement and hierarchy and those kinds of things. On the flip side, when we start to talk about editorial, things like voice and tone, it's like balancing authority as a medical organization or a healthcare organization. Um, this is something that actually came up in an author's uh, call yesterday uh, with some, some other Rosenfeld uh, writers. Uh, so there's authority, balancing that with humility, and then balancing that with empathy. And when you're talking about healthcare, how, you know, we, we all want to have that, that approachable voice and tone, but we're also talking about sometimes very serious things. So it's like finding that balance, you know, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 this is fascinating to hear you talking about this, Natalie, because I've, I've worked a lot with folks in the NIH world and, mm. and, and, and have worked for many, many years with CMS. I don't anywhere with, with the CMS <laughs> as opposed to the content management system, which is actually how I started my career <laughs> back yeah. in the nineties was CMS. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, which, so it's all, it's all really funny. And I, but I remember many, many years ago in the 2000 aughts sometime, and when I had a lot of federal government clients and some of which were then the HHS, HHS world, uh, health and human services for those yep. who aren't in the U.S. Um, world, um, talking about that very problem that you talked about, which was the granularity of regulatory language and terms. And ought we, this is like crazy governance Lisa, like early governance Lisa thinking, we're going to get it all lined up and it's all going to freaking work, right? Ought we to convene and think about normalizing some of the language and how it is handled so that it's easily dispersed via machine and can be updated more efficiently? And why do there have to be all of these little teeny tiny differences? Does it actually make any sense? And so, you know, I think my age then might have had a three in front of it or something like young enough to be dumb enough, basically, <laughs> right? <laughs> to, think, to think that uh, you could do those sorts of things. And I remember everybody looking at me like I was out of my mind. Yeah. Right. So it's making me feel and and I understand, probably understood then, but understand even more now how profoundly protectionists states are, counties are, cities are, blah, yep. blah, blahs are like everybody wants their own, even if it's just like I'm going to dot my eye with a heart instead of with a dot just so I can say it's mine. Right. right? And and so those types of things really, really push against what often seems like a common sense solution. Yeah. Right. The language really doesn't have to be that different. Right. We're right. just going to make a difference because because we can or we're trying to pacify this or that person. So it's really interesting to hear you talk about that from the writing side of it. It makes me feel a little bit vindicated that I wasn't oh, yeah. insane. <laughs> oh, no, no. I remember like um, uh, two jobs ago working on we were working on Medicaid. We were oh, what was it? Uh, we were migrating from. 
one platform to another. And so we had to meet with, you know, the health plan for the particular state. And there were all, you know, we had a, 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 a kind of a rinse and repeat formula, which was awesome. But there would be this minutia of do we call it prior authorization or is it pre-authorization in this market? <laughs> and like we would argue back and forth because then we had to remember to go change it every place yeah. else, yeah. you know. Yeah. And we got a system down. But when I, I remember when I first joined that team, I was so overwhelmed um, just by all the the, the different um, terminology. It would be like, this is almost exactly the same as that other right. market. But, you know, it's like you said about do I do, do a dot or do I do a heart? Um, <laughs> and sometimes we were able to um, – Kind of maybe not on the pre-off thing, but on some other terminology, we were able to get the the health plan to agree that, you know, we were building a web. We were building these websites for providers who may work with other companies as well. And we were trying to find the patterns that fit. So if we could figure out the patterns and then address the outliers after that. It's like, okay, we've, we've got a thing we can work with. Um, and that was the thing where content strategy was really uh, able to shine, even though, you know, we weren't doing that. That was the thing. We weren't really doing a lot of writing. We had, uh, we had copy decks that were pre-filled and, and we would say, okay, this information that you have on your current site is going to look like this and sound like this over here. So we were kind of coming in and saying, this is what it's going to be, and then giving them an opportunity to kind of react to that. Um, we definitely had some, some markets where there was a lot of pushback. Um, but then we had others that go, okay, yeah, this is good. This sounds, this sounds good. You know, as long as we know where where these documents are that that are attached to this content and blah blah blah, we're good. You know, so yeah, it's a it, it's a it's a tough space to work in, but I think um, I think I'm a better content strategist for it if I could say that um, because it really made me stretch and think about you know how can how can content strategy add value to something that is so in some ways narrowly focused and in other ways really broad. It's like all all the things. Yeah. So you've got a book that you're working on about scaling content strategy. And I'm just curious, like what was the moment that you said, or the situation you were in when you're like, Holy shit, I've got to write about this. Like I've got to explain this to everyone else because there's just this gap. And what just happened is so like, it's that monumental moment of like, I'm going to share this experience. It's, it's okay. It's really, it was a couple of things. So before lockdown, so that would have been February, 2020. (laughs) Where are we now? (laughs) I don't even know anymore. Whenever world IA day is, um, I think it was 2020, uh, that year, um, I had been asked to, um, give a talk about, um, content strategy and information architecture and how they're the same and how they're different. So Venn diagram, (laughs) right? And after that talk, which actually went really well, I was just like, literally, I'm when I'm, when I feel like I'm kind of out of my element, I will tell jokes because I'm nervous. (laughs) So of course I started it off with this content strategist walks into an IA conference and yeah, (laughs) I kind of went on from there. As it turns out, the talk was really well received because what I did was I, I did, I did, I put on my reporter hat. I'm not an IA. I don't call myself an IA. Um, But I've had to do that work from time to time, or at least try to muddle my way through. Um, So I put on my reporter hat and I went and found out the things that I don't know about IA. And then I kind of wrote a story in my head and then that ended up being slides and so on and so forth. Um, After that talk, um, during the Q&A and even, you know, during the break time, so many people came up to me and said, how do I find somebody like you? Like, how do we get a team, you know, together? And then, you know, I kept in touch with those people and, you know, did some meetups and that kind of thing. Then the pandemic happened. Fast forward to 
mm, October of last year. And um, I uh, am part of a, a, a great group called Women Talk Design. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but uh, Daniel Barnes is, a, is, is the founder of that organization. And it's basically a, a group that elevates uh, the voices of, of, of women and those who identify uh, as such in um, uh, elevates their their speaking opportunities and elevates articles that they write and that, that kind of thing. So I have a little profile page on there. And Danielle actually wrote to me and said that Lou Rosenfeld had wanted to uh, meet me and could she do an email introduction? And so my brain, I'm thinking, oh, maybe because, you know, Rosenfeld does events, you know, they do conferences. And I was like, maybe they want me to do a talk. I don't know. I was not thinking book at all. And then literally, was it the same day or the week before? Um, people started reaching out to me on LinkedIn after another talk or two that I did. So my audience was kind of growing because I was getting myself out there more because, man, the speaking opportunities when you can like sit in your living room and give a talk is really awesome. Um, <laughs> and um, someone from McAfee, I don't know if I was supposed to say that, but uh, uh what is she, a uh, customer experience uh, director, wanted to understand more about content strategy and was was wondering about, you know, why is it different from marketing and why is it different in UX and CX? And so I got on the phone with her and she's like, I have to build a content strategy team and I don't know where to start. Would you be willing to talk to me? And And I did. And then right after that, I had a call with Lou and I was like, hi, <laughs> don't know what you want, but here I am. And he was like, so tell me about some of the things, you know, I've read some of your articles that you've written and some of the talks and this kind of thing. And right at the end of the call, when I really didn't feel like there was much that I was like, what can I write a book about? Because it was beginning to get clear that, oh, this is about writing a book, um, I said, you know, there's this one question I get all the time, and it's, how do I build a team? And I said, I think, you know, my experience, I have, have experience uh, building and creating and, and, and scaling a smaller team at an agency and then doing the same thing at a, at a larger, more like mid-sized, larger organization. Um, and I think that's the thing that I get asked about the most is how to do that. And that was the moment where Lou was like, Let's set up some more time. I want to talk more about that. And then the process was, let's do an outline. And let's. And I was like, I actually have things to say about this. And here we are. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really that look back at, you know, I did this at a, a very small agency and then I tried to replicate it. Some parts of it worked, some parts of it didn't, but then I took it elsewhere and, you know, we just kept trying until, you know, there were even places where there were established content strategy practices within an organization, but they were all in different business units, kind of doing different things. So some had more visibility in the social media and that space, whereas some of us were like, you know, well, we've got this, you know, content model that we got to do this thing with. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? And you would find that everybody was doing a different thing, but we would come together at least once a month and trade information so that we could we weren't all the same, but we were we, we were trying to learn from each other and that kind of thing. You're cross-pollinating. So. Like, yeah. And eventually it, it normals out into like broccolini. You Ex know? <laughs> exactly. We were making broccolini. <laughs> no, I like that, broccolini. That's such, a, that's such a great story because I'm going through a very similar journey. So I, I started in my role about a little less than a year ago, 10 months ago, and, and we've almost tripled now in size wow. and scale and like we're, we're reaching different areas and we're introducing new disciplines and we're at a point now where we're still seeing it's it's a large company and it's it's a family of companies so there are pockets of design in, in different parts and different companies and it's like it would be great 
if if design was in one place and it was good for like helping right. career paths and maturity, but it's just it's impossible. So how can we actually spread that culture and that learning and that community so that we do have this area that people can learn from each other and organically learnings happen and things come together and that could lead to more scaling and, and eventually could settle an organizational like where it lives in the org. But it really is just about creating that space for learning and sharing and community. And then the rest right. kind of, they mature and scale as that happens. So it's it's great to hear that story. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it, this process of, of writing the book, it's like, um, I'm halfway through chapter six of 10 chapters. I'm so happy to be able to say that. And I just hit the halfway the mark. Hump. Yeah, the and I'm just like I kind of got stuck because I was out of t- I was out of town for a wedding, and <laughs> oh man, that that was ugly. Come trying to come back and start chapter six. I'm like I can't do this. Um, <laughs> yes, you but can. As I I'm feeling I you know I really feel yes, good about can. it. Thank you. You're doing it. Um, I have been thinking more and more that you know it's going to be great. Because there's so many people who have already been written written about the the how to do content strategy, right? It's not a lot of and and someone's written about the types of roles and content that you might want to have on your team, but I don't think really anyone's written about how to actually assemble a team, right? And 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 beyond the team, let's formalize it into a practice. Let's let's make it where there's buy-in, like we talked about at the very beginning across the org so that, you know, the content is an asset and the way we treat content as an asset brings value to the organization and ultimately to our clients, users, whatever. Um, And I was thinking, I was like, well, you know, this is going to be a book that, you know, people who build content strategy organizations. I was like, you know what, this also is, I think, it'll be useful to content teams that are distributed like what we were just talking about across an organization who maybe can't formalize into one, you know, actual organizational practice, but they can organize into a community of practice. It's something that uh, we had at my, at my, uh, in, while I was at Agile 6, was, there was an HCD, community of practice, right? And anybody who was interested in learning about human-centered design could be part of that group. And it's about having a charter and, you know, kind of formalizing it that way. So you may not get, you know, someone who, you know, um, is going to try to go secure headcount and all that kind of stuff. I don't really even get into that in the book. This is just about how do you organize yourself as a content organization or practice so that you can bring the proper – amount of resources and attention to content as an asset, right? And however you do that in your organization or even your place in the organization, here are some ways, here's this blueprint of how you can start to formalize things and bring other people with you at the same time. Right. That's, you know, that's, the, that's just like, that's a good, Andy knows how much I love communities of practice when someone's when i'm trying to help people really formalize and it's almost the exact opposite of what i do really formalize digital governance across all the disciplines of digital and to bring a structured collaboration model that's aimed towards an intentional and measurable goal right, right. like we are trying to do exactly that as opposed to just messing around right right, right? <laughs> and we're going to be organized to do exactly that which is what my job is Oftentimes, people are so far away from that mark, culturally, emotionally, philosophically, so far away from that mark, there's no way they can do what they need to do. Right. And it's shocking how many very large global multinational companies are that. Yep. Right? And so the only reason they can be that way is because they can afford to. Right. right. They're so flush with cash, they can act dumb forever. Right? And it doesn't matter until they're not. And then all of a sudden, they get real sharp. Right? But, so, but in those types of situations, the teams and this is broadly the digital team, which it would include content strategy, right? And all of the disciplines that you've talked about today are still struggling day to day. And honestly, that's what gets me up in the morning is honestly, people go to work and it doesn't feel good. 
mm-hmm. right? And they're building stuff that other b- people have to use. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's not a great combo platter. No. no. Right? And so how can we make digital teams and people on those teams feel better? And community of practice is hands down to me, one of the most powerful things that you can do because it organically aligns people in a non-threatening way. Mm -hmm. You get to talk to each other. You get to be in community in a very sort of low stress type of environment. It's also an opportunity for those who are quote unquote in charge to insert some rules. I'll use the Mm -hmm. R rule. Some rules and introduce some rules that they would like to see come true, right? To really find a place to get those things. It corrals people. And so it's really great to hear you say that about the content strategy community and not forcing organizational centralization because honestly, most of the time, I think that's a mistake. What needs to be centralized is intent. Yes. And certain, and certain standards. Certain yes. standards of and rules of behavior need to be centralized and thought of, but the execution work does not need to happen all in the same pile because then you just end up with people sitting around talking to each other about content strategy all day and completely disconnected from the people that they're supposed to support. Exactly. Right? So, so, but it's, it's weird. It's very hard, Natalie. I don't know. It's like you were, you know, people couldn't see you. You had one hand up and one hand flapping, how you couldn't think of a structured content model <laughs> and write at the same time. It's like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like it, somewhere in that space where it's like a patting your belly and rubbing your yeah. tapping your head and rubbing your belly at the same time. That's exactly There's something it. about applying structure and rigor to something and working in great. Like it's just really hard to get that groove going somehow, but it can be done. It's just, I think it's new. I think, and I think the web forces it, right? It's, it forces us to have to work in this really ambidextrous kind of way that seems to be sort of counterintuitive to human beings. So <laughs> you're going to solve it all in your book. I can't wait to, I can't, I can't wait to see uh, how you talk about that. Cause I think that's a really powerful first step. In, in this conversation today, there are a lot of things that are resonating with like decisions that, that I'm in the middle of, of making and exploring. So it's just, I love to have these conversations. What what I was looking at is I, I just wanted to be super respectful for your time and, you know, thanking you for, for coming on the show. It's, this has been a really fun conversation. So how do people get in touch with you? I know you mentioned someone reached out about wanting help and like, how do I do <laughs> yeah. this? Like, I, we don't yeah. we don't want everyone Everybody's like... Everybody's going to call you. Yeah, exactly. Natalie's phone number is 555. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, without without like banging on your door like how can people stay in touch with you and what you've got going on um definitely you'll find me on linkedin um and even though my display name on my profile has my full name i think it's if you search natalie dunbar you'll find me i have really big hair even though it's pushed back today um <laughs> so that would be me um i am on the twitters and the instagrams <laughs> my handle is the same in both places it's uh, at the literati, T H E L I T E R A T I. Um, I try to be active in both spaces, but I am writing a book. So <laughs> sometimes, oh, there's my internet being unstable again. Sorry. Sometimes uh, it'll it'll take me a minute, but I try to get back to everybody because, you know, I have people who are just getting started in you know, in this space digitally as writers, not knowing, like, do I want to be a content strategist? Do I want to be a digital cop? What do I call myself? Where do I, you know, and then I have people like uh, my, my, my friend from um, McAfee, who was just like, I got to build a team and I don't know where to start. Um, And how do I discern between the different disciplines that are within this whole content world and so on and so forth. So um, I invite all inquiries and I definitely like to share and reach out. So I guess it's a good thing I'm writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait. I for one can't wait to, to read it and learn some more about your insights um, and everything that you're bringing, bringing to the discipline. I think it's absolutely you. fabulous. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It's been great to talk with you both. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy surfacing, please rate, review, and follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. 
Also, consider supporting the podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash surfacingpodcast. If you have suggestions for guests or a topic you'd like to hear about on surfacing, please reach out via the contact form found at surfacingpodcast.com.